always say, and I've worked in the not-for-profit sector previously, I now work in magazine and publishing, um, completely different sectors, but what I always say is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. If you're not listening, if you're not taking the time to understand, you actually can succumb to making horrible, horrible mistakes that actually hurt the very people that you're supposed to be advocating for. So we need to prevent that. And what you can also learn from these stakeholders, because they have their own sense of dignity, their story, their um, experiences, they're actually fighting and protesting at a higher stakes game than you are. So you need to show them respect. What we see asylum seekers doing in um, a lot of the offshore processing centers is actually protesting the very system that is oppressing them. Um, you know, from, for example, writing letters to having an open letter and, and trying to talk to the international community to physically um, hurting themselves and trying to kind of protest. And you have to show respect to that because they are showing far more courage than you are. And by allowing those, those experiences and those expressions to be in the forefront, you're showing them dignity and you're having humility in your own expressions as well. So it's incredibly important. Now, what, like I said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I sort of see it, because I have an international relations background, I sort of see it that this misconception kind of grew out of a white man's burden idea. Um, the white man's burden kind of concept came out of colonialism and um, a lot of white-led Western countries throughout the 18th, 19th, 20th century, where what they saw is that they othered non-white countries and they either their colonial states and they saw them as a burden that they were primitive and that they needed assistance and they spoke for defined um, subjected them to inter-tribal wars they um, enacted um, uh, enacted uh, warfare and disintegration and all that sort of stuff throughout it but then also built things that were not relevant for them you know so they're completely um, disempowered uh, millions of people and so we kind of um, by not recognizing that and by not recognizing the history of that we kind of fall through the cracks when we don't we don't show respect to people who are empowering themselves and emancipating themselves, but we also speak for people, which is very, very dangerous. And you can kind of see in lots of different ways. And I'm going to give you some examples that are not exactly about um, advocacy work or non-for-profit work. For example, the US Civil War, a lot of people think that Abraham Lincoln went through and emancipated the blacks and um, the African-American community throughout um, who had experienced slavery for decades and decades and it was absolutely atrocious. What actually happened is that they fought for themselves, they emancipated themselves and that historians overlook that and so we need to listen to those voices and understand that they had been fighting for far longer than any um, legislator in the co congressional community were. Um, another thing, structural adjustment policies. Structural adjustment policies are externally led policies that went through um, uh, developing countries and adjusted their policies, their governmental policies, their economies and things like that in a bid to take people out of poverty. What happened was they had a one-size-fits-all policy for all these different countries and they actually caused more poverty than benefited them. Another thing is a green revolution. So I'm running through. I'm very sorry, but we can discuss this. You can have questions. But the green revolution happened in the 70s. And what happened was we had external forces, normally Western-led trade organizations that went into Southeast Asian countries, changed their agricultural policies and the, you know, this from seeds to, to trading. And they changed the way that they traded, the way they grew food and sustained themselves. And they actually caused mass starvation because of crop failure. Um, and then another thing which is close to home is our Australian Indigenous policies. Um, a lot of it is paternalistic, it's externally led, we're not listening to the leaders of over 200 nations in Australia, and so we implement policies that ultimately fail the very people that we're supposed to be benefiting. So those are the things that we need to prevent from happening. So that's the kind of concept of mitigating negative consequences. Now, what does this look like? If we're listening to the voices, what do we need to do also in addition to that? Number one is not using other people's experiences for the cause without their consent. Um, 
this is highly important because people don't want to be made into a caricature. They do, they're not defined by a one single experience. They're not defined by that struggle. They're, they have families and histories and culture and passions and that needs to be expressed in its entirety. The second thing is not allowing that experience, like I said, to define that personhood. Now, I'm going to admit where I come from, I was originally a refugee to Australia. Um, I'm originally from Iraq, I'm Kurdish, which is the largest, one of the largest displaced ethnic minorities in the world. And so I was quite stateless for several years with my family, walking across several countries, all that sort of stuff. So whenever someone whinges to me about walking, I'm like, don't worry about it, I've been there. Um, except I can't go for a run for more than 100 meters at a time, so really go figure. <laughs> and so what happened was I became a token where um, I was accessible, I look like me, I have um, white passing privilege, I'm not, I'm not kind of dealing with the racial consequences on, um, on like the offset. So w I was very comfortably the token kid, where I was paraded around as the refugee kid, oh look at her, she can articulate herself and she's, you know, she's doing well at school and she's involved in the community and so, but Instead of um, identifying my strengths and capabilities, I was kind of seen and siloed in this particular category where people would just talk to me about my refugee experience instead of actually asking me, what have you done since then? Um, what, you know, like actually get to know me as a person and as an individual. And so we fall into this thing where we, we um, stereotype, even if we're on this side of the discussion, we can stereotype people and silo them into particular um, identities. And, w and as I said before, we're not, we're not in silos, we're all individuals, we all have different experiences and nuanced experiences. And so this leads me to privilege. Yes. So in our world, uh, as far, you know, although we have like a, um, yeah, let's kind of capitalist, neoliberal, kind of liberal democracy, individualist mindset in this country. Um, and we like to believe that all individuals are responsible for every action and reaction that they um, experience. Where we're not really floating around, not interacting with each other. We like to collectivize because we're human beings. We like to connect and network. And because we do like to do that, we also succumb to the intersectional levels of oppression and experiences that have been built and socialize within us. And let me explain this. Every one of us, um, even myself included, have different levels of privilege. Um, uh, so I would accept that um, although I am a woman of color, I have white passing privilege. So I don't deal with the racial um, consequences that are so direct. Um, uh, I am able-bodied. I'm, um, I'm straight. Um, you know, I don't have to deal with a lot of the things that LGBTIQA community deals with every day. Um, so I have lots of privilege. I am university educated. Um, my parents were university educated in Iraq, which also influences my experience. So I have a lot of privilege. Um, but then at the same time, I'm from a refugee background. I was from a lower socioeconomic background. Um, and I had to deal with kind of building myself without any of the networks and things like that. So it's sort of this process of understanding what intersections can you empathize with, you experience, and what intersections that you benefit from and, um, and have privilege from. And so once you realize that, you have to kind of have a sense of humility. So you can't speak for an experience that is not your own. Um, you can't define it. And what you need to do is say, well, I have the emotional energy and um, the time to invest and stand by and be and help and be an ally to someone who is not as privileged as I am. And so that's the way that you have to kind of approach it. You're not speaking for them. This is not your fight, but you will stand behind them. So like I said before, asylum seekers and refugees have been emancipating themselves. They, they're fighting. And so what your job is, is to stand behind them and to use your privilege and to use your networks and your voice, your education um, and, and all of those kind of elements that you benefit from to he help and assist that cause. And that kind of can assist you in lots of different types of causes that do take your passions, but in showing humility and gratitude for what you benefit from, you actually gain a lot of energy and support and time to listen and time to understand people who are not as privileged as you. Thank you.